Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. And today we're going to be talking all about pull up resistors on an SPI interface. Should you do it? And why would you do it? I think this is one of those pieces of design guidance that somebody did in an application note 30 years ago, and now everybody thinks they need to put pull-up resistors on SPI interfaces. We're gonna dig into how this actually works, what it does to the interface, and whether or not you actually need to do it in your design. Let's go ahead and get started. Now this topic of pull-up resistors on an SPI bus came up as a viewer question on one of our older SPI versus I2C or I squared C videos. Ravindra writes, thanks for giving free valuable knowledge, but in our SPI application, we use pull-up resistors, 3.3 kilo ohms, on the SI, SO, and SCK pins. Is it required or not? Please suggest. This is not the first time I've seen a recommendation to put pull-up resistors on an SPI bus. If you look at the pins they recommend placing these on, it varies pretty wildly as well. Sometimes the recommendation is just for the CS pin or the chip select pin. Sometimes the recommendation is for all of the pins. Sometimes the recommendation is just for the MISO pin or the MOSI pin. So it really depends on who you ask. We've also seen this used in some of our design review videos. Take a look here at this schematic from Vincent Nguyen for his amulet controller design. Here you can see he's applied a two kilo ohm pull-up resistor on the meso line from his driver going to the rest of his precision motor control circuit. However, he hasn't applied it to any of his other lines. Also, let's take a look here at this FPGA development board from Sohaib Zaidi. Here he has SPI lines coming into a 16 megabit serial flash and to an EEPROM. If we take a look here at the flash chip, we can see that he has applied a pull-up resistor to the chip select pin, but not to the MOSI or MISO pins. He's also applied a resistor to the clock pin, but he has another resistor as a pull-down going to ground, basically forming a voltage divider. Take a look at this EEPROM. Here on this EEPROM, he has the pull-ups applied to all of the lines except for the clock. And then he has the digital output and the digital input wired together with a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor. So the reason I show all of these different examples is because clearly the guidance is really all over the place and there appears to be no rhyme or reason as to why or when you should use pull-up resistors on an SPI bus. Looking on the internet doesn't seem to help much either because if you start looking on forums like EDA board or Stack Exchange, you're gonna find mixed guidance as well. Take a look at this post on the Texas Instruments E2E forum. On this E2E forum post, you can see here that they're asking about using pull-up resistors on SPI for the TPS 65987 USB PD controller. In this data sheet, they do recommend using a pull-up resistor, but only in the case where the pin is configurable. Here you can see in the data sheet that their GPIOs are configurable. They can be configured as a push-pull output, which is what you would use in SPI, or as an open drain output, which is what you would use in I squared C. And with the I squared C case, you would have to have a pull-up resistor for current limiting. Now, obviously, the guidance also varies depending on whether we're talking about configurable or reconfigurable pins. So to figure all this out, let's take a look at what is actually happening inside of an I squared C buffer on the whiteboard, and we'll see if we can figure out some guidance that we should follow. So let's take a look at what happens inside of an SPI bus, and then we can see whether or not we need to have a pull up. So inside of an SPI bus, we have our power input, and then we come down to a PMOS, and then this comes down to our output. Our output then also connects to an NMOS, and then we have this going down to ground. At this input, this is generally enhancement mode. Same thing here, this one is gonna be enhancement mode. And then we have our input coming in here to a square wave. And then we have the square wave being sourced right here. Now this is basically an inverter. On the falling edge here, this switches so that the top PMOS is conducting 
and then we have a signal that comes out. It switches so that now the NMOS is conducting and then that discharges this transmission line and load that's connected to our output pin and then all of that current drains back into ground. So that's basically how this circuit works. So this is just a CMOS inverter. Normally we have this connected to, for example, a transmission line. The transmission line comes over here and then we have a load capacitance. That load capacitance then connects to ground. Now this load capacitance isn't literally a capacitor, of course, it's just the capacitances of whatever transistors make up the logic circuit that's in this load component. What happens if we were to then, let's say, put a pull-up resistor right here and then run that up to a voltage source, we'll say it's also VDD. What's gonna happen here? Let's suppose that we have this CMOS buffer such that the PMOS side is currently conducting. Well, here, if this is conducting, the only resistance that this PMOS is going to provide is R on, which is going to be a very small number. Whereas this pull-up resistor can be anything from 1K all the way up to 10K. Well, clearly, if I put a very small on-state resistance in parallel with this 1K to 10K resistor, it's gonna be like this resistor is not even there. Essentially, it doesn't matter. So in that case, all the current is just gonna flow through the, the PMOS side just as if the resistor was not there. What happens in the case where we have it flipped and now the NMOS side is conducting? Well, in that case, the NMOS is going to allow all of the current that is charged up along this transmission line to then sink back to ground. And here, the only limiting resistance is again, the on-state resistance of the channel in this NMOS side of this buffer. Now, there is going to be some current that can also flow down through this resistor, through the input, and then back down here through ground. However, it's going to be much smaller than the current that's discharging from this transmission line and load capacitance. So in that case, we can essentially also ignore whatever is happening here with this pull-up resistor. So clearly, the pull-up resistor doesn't have any effect on the basic functionality or switching of this CMOS inverter circuit. The CMOS inverter circuit is going to be able to switch back and forth at the same rate regardless of the presence of this pull-up resistor. In fact, if you look at some data sheets, some data sheets will already include a pull-up resistor here inside of the chip. Why would they do that? Well, it could be in the case where, for example, this buffer is actually reconfigurable. Because if this is reconfigurable, and let's say it can be configured as an open drain output, well, the open drain output essentially bypasses this PMOS side. So if this PMOS is totally bypassed, then this has to have a pull up here. And they may include it inside that buffer in that chip. Now you could also put the pull up out here outside of the chip as a discrete component if you configure this buffer as an open drain output. Because then if you were to put a 1K resistor here, some of that current is also going to flow through that 1K resistor. If this is an internal pull up, typical values could be as high as 100K. So much larger resistance on the pull up if it's internal to the chip versus the discrete resistor that you put outside the chip. And in fact, if you go back and you look up that TPS USB PD controller that we were looking at on screen just a moment ago, you'll see that they have internal pull-ups applied. And those internal pull-ups can be 100K ohms. Now, obviously the presence of this pull-up resistor doesn't impact the switching functionality of this CMOS buffer. So what are some of the reasons for even putting a pull-up resistor on some of these SPI lines? Well, let's consider just for a moment that this is the chip select line or CS. One of the pieces of guidance that you will sometimes see is to put the pull-up resistor on the chip select line. So that would basically be over here by the load and we would apply it just like this. Now, let's suppose for a moment that this chip select line is being pulled up to VDD. Now, as we pull up this chip select line to VDD, what it will do is it will hold the chip select line in a specific logic state. And if this is an active low pin on our load, then it's going to hold this load turned off 
So that way it doesn't respond to any noise anywhere else on the bus. Now, this is one of the pieces of guidance that you'll see with regard to memory chips. If you do this on a memory chip, the supposed guidance is that it will prevent any corruption of the memory that's being stored in that chip. So I think that's one area where it could be reasonable to put the pull-up resistor on the chip select line, and it essentially prevents corruption of any of the stored data as the system starts up. Because as the system starts up, these output lines on this bus could be in an indeterminate state. And so it might be possible that it then corrupts the data in the memory if the chip select line is allowed to float. If the chip select line is allowed to float, it might float down to zero. That then turns on this, this uh, SPI interface in this memory chip. And then that allows any of the other lines that then output some noise to then impact the data on the chip. So that is one potential possibility. But now let's consider just for a moment that maybe this is on a second power rail. Let's call it VDD2. Well, in that case, do we really need to deal with putting a pull-up resistor on this line? I don't really think we do. I think this is something that could probably be solved with power sequencing. If you're power sequencing these different rails in the correct order, you would then ensure that this chip is turned off before this chip ends up coming up to its operational voltage and then initializes the bus in the initial state. So in that case, you really wouldn't have to worry about putting a pull-up resistor on the CS line. This really then just becomes kind of a source of insurance so that you don't risk corrupting any of the data in this peripheral. Now, what if this is not a memory chip? What if it's some other kind of chip? Like maybe it's an ASIC and it has an SPI interface on it. Well, I think whether or not you wanna do this depends on the type of ASIC. But again, I think if you apply power sequencing to these rails in the correct order, that really becomes a non-issue and you don't have to then pull any of those lines up to one of your voltage rails. Bottom line is, it doesn't matter if you put this pull-up resistor down here at this input on the load or if you put it over here at the driver output or anywhere else in between, that pull-up resistor is not going to have an impact on the switching characteristics of this buffer when it's in this push-pull configuration. The reason is, again, you're putting this very large resistance in parallel with a very small resistance, and so this very large resistance is not going to have any impact on the switching characteristics of this PMOS. It's also not going to have any effect on the discharge rate through this NMOS when this inverter switches. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Keep those awesome questions coming. Of course, I can't hit all of your questions, but I do my best. And if you ask a great one, it just might end up in one of these videos. Make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time.